This 500 gallon bow front reef tank has been running for almost a year now. It's performed extremely well. Um, the corals are doing fantastic. The fish are doing really well. The calcium and alkalinity is where we want it with the dose units. Uh, we've got the phosphates under control, but our nitrates are getting a little out of control. We're up to about 50 parts per million. Um, there's been no algae issues in the tank, which is the result of what the efforts of the algae scrubbers have done. But again, we've got a nitrate problem. So today, we're going to install a sulfur reactor. The equipment has also performed extremely well. We did have a little bit of a refrigeration issue, but it had nothing to do with the refrigeration unit specifically. It had to do with the, um, the weave or the tightness of the screen that was put on the inlet side of the chiller as far as the cabinet is concerned. We ended up having to pull the chiller out, uh, pull the old screen out, put in something that wasn't so restrictive, and since then we've had no issues from temperature. And today, uh, or the last few days has been one of those extremely windy Santa Ana, LA windy days and it's in the 90s so the chiller is maintaining the tank between 80 and 82 degrees consistently. So uh, we're going to place probably the sulfur reactor right at, uh, about down inside there. Uh, so I'm going to start unloading the stuff and Scott will be here shortly uh, and he's going to install it and discuss it for us. The equipment itself consists of the calcium reactor, there's the sulfur beads, some calcareous gravel, and the Comer peristaltic pump, as well as some um, tubing. And what we're going to end up doing is drawing water out of the sump, passing it into uh, the calcium reactor, and then allowing that uh, water to flow back into the sump itself. The peristaltic pump or the Comer pump will give us a very slow regulated flow. The whole concept or idea is a very slow flow that becomes basically oxygen depleted inside the cal canister which in turn creates an anaerobic condition through the use of sulfur and bacteria that colonize the sulfur um, and that in turn basically reverses the nitrification process. Uh, essentially those bacteria will try to rob or break the oxygen bond on the nitrate molecule, thus liberating uh, nitrogen gas or in the form of gas and then allowing the water uh, to return into the sump that is uh, free of the nitrate itself. And he's already starting to load the uh, filter media into the reactor. Are you going to um, mix or just layer? Layer. You got this divider here and this divider is so they can be separated. Aha, so you don't mix it, you divide it. Yes, that's correct. And in particular you have the calcareous stuff on top? Yep, the calcareous stuff goes on top as a buffer and it's a three to one ratio of three parts of the one media, one part of the other. So I just want to make sure that I actually get three parts here at least of the calcium. So you know that way if I need to remove some of the other stuff I can. And what's the calcium stuff do? It acts as a buffer. Raising the pH back up? Ideally, yeah. Because the sulfur stuff's going to drive it down? It's going to drive the pH down a little bit and more importantly, the alkalinity. So we don't want to drop our alkalinity too much, but it's kind of par for horse these things from what I'm understanding. So did you eyeball to see where I was going to put that reactor? I have not yet, no. No, but what I do want to do before I uh, put this lid back on is I think I want to fill it up with water, um, put the salt water in it, because with the dosing pump, it's going to take so long to prime. Well, we're going to end up having to steal water either from the tank or my next service. You know, wherever we steal it from. Um, 
know, it's going to go back in the tank, so. so yeah, I want to kind of prime it with water. Um, and then what you're going to do, we're going to set this thing at about two drips a second. And, uh, you know, you'll test your nitrates on the effluent side in about a week, see where they're at. You know, what we don't want to do is drop the nitrates in the tank down to zero. Um, so you're going to have to kind of find a balance there uh, with regards to that in the tank. You know, I think we probably want to aim for like maybe 0 0.10 nitrates, try to keep in balance with the phosphates. Um, but, you know, you're going to want to keep an eye on that. What we don't want to do is, is have this thing strip the tank of nitrates. The other thing that we need to do is we need to test the alkalinity today and make sure, you know, know where the alkalinity is at because what's going to happen is this thing starts to kick in, it's going to deplete alkalinity in the tank and we're going to have to make adjustments to the dosing regimen to maintain the alkalinity levels that we were. So it's two things that, you know, we're going to need to be aware of. Um, this will take probably 10 days to 14 days to start, you know, really generating the bacteria, the denitrifying bacteria where you'll see the effluent start dropping to zero, at which point you'll increase the flow rate through it and then retest, you know, technically you should test every couple of days, but you're here weekly, so you'll test the nitrate, the effluent nitrates in a week, and you can start adjusting the speed of the flow, the flow rate, higher, uh, trying to maintain, you know, zero nitrates, or if we're aiming for 0 0.10, ideally, we'd shoot for like 0 0.10 nitrate, you know, on the effluent side. That way we maintain the target nitrate level, and we don't deplete the tank of nitrates, because corals need nutrients. So if we strip it of nutrients, the corals are going to react adversely. So it's something, you know, that we need to be cognizant of as this thing starts building up the nitrifying bacteria and starts doing its job. So next thing is to figure out where that's going. Uh, fortunately, we have a couple outlets there uh, that we can plug into. One for the uh, feed pump. We're using a peristaltic feed pump. This little mower pump, and it'll allow us to adjust the flow rate with the turn of a dial as opposed to using a needle valve, which is prone to clogging up. So this will give us good flow over the effluent rate through the reactor. Um, and then of course the reactor also has a circulation pump or does it not? Uh, I believe so. There's another box inside that box. There's a circulation pump in here uh, as well. So uh, we'll need two outlets for that, which we'll get to here in a minute. But the first thing to do is going to be to prime this thing with some water, get some water in that thing so that we're not using the dosing pump to fill it up, otherwise it's going to take an hour or more to purge that thing of air. So, uh, Jim, where are we putting this thing? Right down in there? Yeah. I think that's the best place. Okay. What do you have that I can use to fill that thing? So the aquarium portion, as far as cleaning is concerned, is relatively easy. This is one week's worth of algae growth here, and I show up weekly. Uh, typically, all I need to do is use my $500 aquarium cleaning magnets um, and go across and clean the interior of the tank itself. The bulk of the work that I do for service is actually outside in regards to water change, uh, filter media replacement, etc. So I'm going to go ahead and start servicing the inside of the tank now. So Scott is assembling the reactor. He's got a, a bubble counter mounted to its outside. It looks like he's got the circulation pump for the uh, reactor mounted to its outside. He's already added uh, the water to the reactor so that it's going to be primed. And of course he's doing a, a proper thing and that is reading the instructions. Because these magnets are so strong, I always make it a point to set the magnet itself, the outside one here on the lip or the uh, step of the ladder. That way I can place the cleaning magnet inside and not have to juggle both of them at the same time. Because I got my finger caught in there once. It was kind of painful. The magnet cleaning process is actually quite simple. And while the strength of the magnet is significant, the thickness of the acrylic panels allows for the inner and outer magnets to pretty much glide quite easily back and forth. I always start at the top and work my way down towards the bottom, the bottom being where I'm most likely going to pick up that granule of gravel and scratch the acrylic. But I also had the cabinet maker create the lip at the bottom of the tank 
a couple of inches above the sand layer, this then minimizes the chance that I'm going to pick up a granule of gravel between the magnet and the acrylic material. I also thoroughly wash the inside magnet in the sink before and after using the aquarium cleaning magnets. Fairly simple as far as cleaning the interior of the tank. So the sulfur reactor is now in its position and he's working on the uh, peristaltic pump referred to as the Comer pump and then I guess he's going to then try to decide where he's going to draw the water in and out from uh, as far as uh, getting water for the reactor. So there are two areas that I have to kind of put a little extra effort into and that is here along the bottom with the aquarium cleaning magnet. We did have them build the cabinet so that this trim kind of comes up above the sand layer for two reasons. One, I didn't want to see the sand layer and two, it minimizes the magnet picking up sand. So, your cool nano reef tank is doing great, but you've got an algae problem? Consider the drop from Santa Monica filtration. Seven sizes to easily fit into the filter compartment of most nano tanks. And just like their bigger cousins, the Hawk and the Surf, all use air bubbles and LED light technology to grow algae. Algae that consumes nutrients and that algae replaces itself at no new cost to you. For more information on Santa Monica Filtration's drop, hog, and surf algae scrubbers, visit santa-monica.cc. Hello, my name's Jim Stein and I operate Aquarium Design and I offer aquarium sales, installation, supplies, livestock, and aquarium maintenance in Thousand Oaks, Westlake Village, Agora Hills, Calabasas, and Malibu, California. I specialize in custom aquariums ranging from freshwater, saltwater fish, living coral reef, and jellyfish display systems. I've been involved professionally and at many levels within the aquarium industry since 1987, and have been in business for myself since 1999. I've worked for many people, and some for over 20 years now. My team can provide you with a unique range of aquarium systems ranging from rectangular in-wall to freestanding cylinders, bow fronts, and custom curved shapes. Additionally, we can offer a variety of aquascapes such as an artificial coral insert, coral skeleton decorations, custom-made branching rock structures, and themed environments such as this Jules Verne version of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. With today's technology in energy efficient DC water pumps and LED lighting, operating costs are much lower. We can automate many of the maintenance features such as water replenishment, water changes, lighting schedule including moonlight lighting, and even your general daily feedings. I can even install an app on your smartphone that will allow you to monitor, to be notified, to control and view your aquarium anywhere in the world. If you're looking for something truly unique, give me a call and let's discuss the possibilities of creating your aquatic dream. I'm knowledgeable, insured and very reliable. My name is Jim Stein and you can reach me at 805-241-7140. I look forward to helping you achieve your aquatic dream. When you think of Tunzi products, you probably think of protein skimmers, internal pumps, and submersible filters. But did you know Tunzi also offers water level controllers, reverse osmosis water purification systems, pH, temperature, and ORP instrumentation? Are you aware of Tunzi's full line of various filter medias and LED lighting? Have you seen Tunzi's updated line of Turbell pumps, the Nano Stream, the Stream, and the Master Stream, along with their controllers? In addition to their wide product line, what Tunzi in Germany wants you to also see is their technology, their quality, their craftsmanship, and in particular, their people 
and the pride that goes into every one of their products and its assembly. Tunzi, high-tech aquarium ecology. Hi there, my name's Jim Stein and you know me as the LA Fish Guy. Well, I also wear a couple of other hats. One of them is the jellyfish tank called the Jelly Aquarium, and the third is MyFishTank.com. I offer an entire line of acrylic aquariums ranging from rectangular to hexagon, flatback hex, as well as the custom curve front aquariums. There's also an entire line of stands and canopies ranging from MDF to pine to oak with a variety of different finishes available. And the website is even smart enough that you can calculate what the freight and crate charges to your location will be. That's myfishtank.com. Reef Hobbyist Magazine believes that our hobby, our fellow hobbyists, and the animals in our care are best served by the free distribution of quality information. Reef Hobbyist Magazine provides hobbyists with critical husbandry information with an emphasis on marine ornamental breeding efforts. Reef Hobbyist Magazine is available for free in local fish stores across the country or you can subscribe at www.reefhobbyistmagazine.com. The second thing is the magnet's able to reach beyond um, the interior magnet. The cleaning portion is able to reach beyond where the exterior magnet grabs a hold of. So I've got about an inch extra uh, extension, I guess would be the word, uh, that the magnet can kind of clean. And so what that does, as you saw on the bottom, is cleans below that trim at the bottom. It also works for here on the sides as well. All right, so we've got it all set up. Uh, right now, I've got the uh, peristaltic pump pulling water into there, and we've got this little thing open here so we can purge the air out of there. So I've got it running at full speed, and obviously there's gonna be some air in here and elsewhere in there, so it's gonna take a little while to get this thing fully filled. So do you have the circulation pump? for the canister running? No. Okay. No, because all that's gonna do is stir up the air in there, so I don't wanna do that just yet. Um, so you're just getting water from the system through the reactor and back out into the system. Right, but right now it's still purging air. You can see here, there's nothing coming out of the effluent side right now. So we've got water going in. I can see this is dual full now, which is the intake side. What's that big white thing? An adjustment of some sorts? Which, that yeah, but we're not using that. I open that all the way up. Peristaltic pump is what's going to control our flow versus using a needle valve. That, you know, needle valves, they tend to clog up and stuff. So that's the advantage of the peristaltic pump is, you know, like with a calcium reactor, when you feed using a, a peristaltic pump, these tend to be a much more consistent flow wise. So that's the way we're rolling with this thing. Now I'm just finishing up the programming. Sure. What programming? Well, on the apex. So we got we're using different different outlets now. So where does what's the apex controlling? Uh, hang on. Uh, the apex. Well, we've got these things plugged into the apex basically. Used five. Will be. And the advantage of having these items plugged into the apex will be. Uh, you could remotely turn it off if exactly. needed. Yep. It's not controlling anything, though. Nope. Okay. Nor monitoring. Correct. Had I got that uh, PM1 or PM2 module on a probe, we could have put that into the top of the uh, canister right, for monitoring and monitored ORP. the pH or calcium or no, ORP, ORP is what you'd be monitoring. Uh, of the inside of the reactor, but we decided not to go that route. And there is a plug for that um, probe port. Yeah, wherever I just dropped it, down there. Oh, yeah, for that pro port, yes, there's a bunch of that, too. So there is one other area that's a little more, uh, requires a little more effort, and that is this very top inside here that you can still visually see from the outside of the tank. And what I need to do is get in there with the uh, cleaning pad and manually wipe that off. The magnet doesn't reach in there far enough. The other issue is these seams, which are really nice, but they do seem to hold a little bit of algae inside there, and it's kind of hard, A, to focus. Put 
my finger up here. I'm going to focus on my finger. Maybe, maybe not. You know, the uh, inside front seams got only a little bit of algae growing inside of them, but also some calcareous algae. So I've got to get in there every once in a while and scrape that out of there. Um, otherwise, the bottom ends up being real clean. But again, it's the top here that you can kind of see. And if I don't get that, it doesn't look good. What I do use to get the inner top is both my pad on a stick and my plastic bladed scraper. These two seem to get the brown spots as well as the calcareous algae. On occasion, I will use my metal blade on a long rod to clean the algae out of those two front outer seams, but that's always risky as the metal blade can very easily scratch the acrylic. So it kind of comes down to the worser of the two evils, either scratch marks on the acrylic or a slight algae buildup in the seams. So that's pretty much the cleaning of the inside of the tank. There's the top of the tank itself. Um, the rest of the maintenance uh, every other week consists of a 100-gallon water change, uh, the changing of the GFO media, cleaning of the protein skimmer, um, cleaning of the algae scrubbers, but the basic cleaning of the system here uh, is what you just saw, usually using the aquarium cleaning magnet. We're going to go out and check and see how Scott's coming along and then we'll come back in and we'll kind of give you a little inventory on how the tank itself, coral-wise and fish-wise, is doing. Alright, so uh, we're all set up. It's been running for, I don't know, probably 20 minutes or so. There's no leaks. Um, purge pretty much all the air out. The circulation pump on it is running. And uh, right now, uh, it's going to take probably 10 to 14 days or so to build up the bacteria in there, the denitrifying bacteria. So next week when Jim comes back, he'll pull a sample from the effluent there, test the nitrate on it, test the nitrate in the tank. And if the nitrate is lower than what's in the tank water, then we know that it's starting to do its job and it's building up the bacteria. Um, and it's going to take probably you know, about two weeks or so um, before it's really kind of kicking butt. Um, where he should be close to zero on the nitrates. Um, he tested his phosphates and his phosphates are 0.05 in the tank. So my suggestion would be is to try to get this thing dialed into where it's about um, five ppm, where it's maintaining about five parts per million nitrate. That way we stay in ratio, um, red field ratio, if you will. Uh, but that way the phosphate and the nitrates are balanced. But you know, it's all set up now. We've got it running off the peristaltic pump. It's running at about two drips a second or so on the effluent side. Uh, next week, depending on what his readings are, he can increase the speed a little bit um, or the flow rate through it a little tiny bit um, or leave the status quo until he comes back. The idea is that once it hits zero, that's when you want to start increasing the flow rate. So uh, that's about it for now. So I got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, one thing that we do want to do is test the alkalinity because with these sulfur reactors, they tend to deplete alkalinity. And so we're going to test the alkalinity today and he'll test again next week. And based on those numbers, I'll start making adjustments to the alkalinity dosing regimen on the tank. Seven point nine. It was eight point three last week. Yeah, but one thing, you know, if you're kind of just eyeballing that line too, a lot of people actually use a uh, syringe to measure the amount of water they get in that little vial because that line's not always accurate. And that way, every time they do it, if you have a little bit more water in there than you did the last time, then your numbers are going to be off, but it's still in a good range. So we'll keep an eye on that and uh, see where it's at next week before we start making any changes. So we'll go ahead and clean up here a little bit and then we'll go ahead and give you an inventory of how, how well on the fish and corals and how well they're doing. And I must say, it's been a little while since I've been here. This tank has come a long way. Very impressed. Yeah, pat on Jim's back. Okay, so the tank itself is really doing remarkably well. The corals are doing extremely, uh, there's growth, noticeable growth, and the fish are all doing well. I think I only lost really two fish out of the whole tank, a multi-bar 
uh, angel, which is not easy to keep, and a naso tang, which wasn't a surprise. It was a bit of a disappointment, though. Um, a number of euphilia corals, uh, toadstools, some giant uh, fuzzy mushrooms. Uh, got some Duncan corals, again, torch corals, uh, some trumpet corals, a few soft corals scattered here and there. Interesting thing, this uh, bird's nest has a uh, coral goby living inside of it, and it seems to be something common amongst not only that particular coral, but from that particular wholesaler, because somebody else confirmed it as well. There's quite a few different clownfish in the tank. This is the rock I call Pinhead Rock, which has a number of uh, Acropora or Acros growing on it. Uh, there's some uh, bird's nest corals, some raspberry corals, uh, some more bird's nest. Uh, there's some corals there with some big long polyp extension. Strawberry shortcake there in the back. Um, got some Montipra capricornis that's going to grow into each other. Uh, again, more hammer corals. Got a few pieces of soft coral in there, and there's even a large um, green star polyp down at the bottom. Uh, as far as the fish are concerned, there's uh, originally about a dozen antheas in the tank. I think there's only eight or nine of them at the moment. There should be uh, about a half a dozen Bangai cardinals. I think there's also a half a dozen uh, pajama cardinals. There's a school of uh, high fin cardinals, uh, 24 of them in the tank. And when they do come out and move around as one, it's really quite uh, interesting. Uh, there is a uh, sand sifting goby in the tank um, who doesn't do as good a job as I'd like on the sand, but he's been in the tank for a number of months. Uh, wish he did a little bit better job on the sand. Uh, again, some damsels, uh, royal gramas. Uh, there's about four different flame angels in there. So overall, I'm very pleased, and so is the homeowner as far as how well the tank is doing. I was reminded last night of a comment that I've made in past videos, and it's a comment that uh, quite frequently keeps coming up. And it was originally made as um, kind of a, a self-motivation thing on my part um, for, you know, just getting things done and sometimes when it's difficult you just got to put one foot in front of the other. Um, and uh, I want to just acknowledge that a number of people seem to have grasped a hold of that and it was really quite unintentional on my part. Um, but since a number of people have in fact um, grasped a hold of it and this particular fellow said that he was had, whenever he had a tough day he would think back uh, to the video he watched of me when I made that particular comment. So, with that said, uh, we'll probably be filming more episodes. I do want to get into my LA Frag Guys series, which will be me getting into the coral frag market. Uh, so that'll be um, some upcoming videos. Uh, again, a new series here in a little bit. But with regards to that comment I made, I guess I'll close this video with that. Always keep moving forward. <laughs>